that asked if we could direct Your Honor's attention to particular admissions that were of importance. Um, and what I would suggest is the following. Since we owe Your Honor some sub-exhibits on other issues where we've identified excerpts, we would suggest that we submit along with those what we would call 693A that would identify what portions of exhibits we are particularly directing the Court's attention to. Um, if that's acceptable, Your Honor, we'll do that. If you'd rather have it right now before we close, we'll do our best to walk through it. Well, I think that's acceptable, subject, of course, to any amplification or uh, clarification that the defendants wish to offer. I think that's it. And then the last point I've been asked by my team to raise, I mentioned the 100 documents that we received last night. Um, we also received last night at 11.30 a privilege log with 7,500 documents listed. Um, and I'm told that about 1,500 of those had been on a prior privilege log, but about 6,000 are documents that are being described to us for the first time ever. And we wanted to simply raise that matter to the court and identify the fact that if we have issue with whether those are truly privileged and we wind up fighting over that and giving them uh, and getting those documents, there may be a need, even after we rest, to introduce some of those withheld documents into evidence. I had thought that the magistrate's order had required the production to be completed a week ago. Is that not correct? Production, yes, but the privilege log, I believe, uh, is what we're now getting. And, and there's documents described that because they're claiming a First Amendment privilege, we've never seen. Yes, Your Honor. We, we had until yesterday to produce the privilege logs. So after we finished and completed our production, we went ahead and then put together this privilege log, which was uh, we did a notice of filing and a motion to file it under seal, and we produced under the, uh, the protective order attorney's eyes only to the other side a non-redacted version of the protective order. Did the magistrate give you until yesterday to produce the privilege log? Yes, Your Honor. I think that the privilege log should be due when the documents are due. But if, if that's what the magistrate did and you're complying with it, well, then that's fine. And I'd also like to clarify that there was a small number of documents that were produced. I think it was 14 or 15 documents, and it was simply ones that in finalizing the privilege log we determined should not have been on there. And so, of course, in due diligence, produced them to the other side. And you know, our point would simply be to, to preserve our, our position that if there were documents that were produced for the first time last night, or described to us under a privilege log for the first time last night, <coughs> there may be a need to come to Your Honor even after we rest and present documents that were not available to us uh, in sufficient time to use. Well, I assume under these circumstances the defendants will not object to a motion to reopen based upon uh, this additional production. You may very well uh, contest whether these documents should be produced or not or should be introduced or not, but uh, I wouldn't think you'd be in a position to argue that the plaintiffs are precluded from attempting to reopen if necessary. We would not have an objection provided that if it was ultimately determined that some of these documents were not privileged, that if they did come into evidence, we would have the opportunity to respond as well. Very well. So we can deal with the mechanics of it. Very well. Thank you, then, Your Honor. And I will hand over the reins to Mr. Boyce. Well, Mr. Boyce. Purely ceremonial, Your Honor. Um, uh, subject to the qualifications that have already been expressed, uh, the plaintiff's rest. Well, Mr. Thompson. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, the de defendant interveners would like to call Professor Kenneth Miller to the stand. <coughs> <coughs> My name is Kenneth P. Miller, M-I-L-L-E-R, K-E-N-N-E-T-H. 
And, Your Honor, we, we'd like to start with just a, a bit of housekeeping. We have a list of exhibits that were materials that Professor relied upon, and we've sought plaintiff's consent to move them into evidence, and we've been told they have no objection. I have a list that I'd like to tender to the Court, if I may. Very well. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. <coughs> And, and in addition, I think that tender may uh, obviate the need for, for using this binder very much, but may I approach and hand out one binder? By all means. Thank you, Your Honor. Professor Miller, uh, where did you attend college? I attended college at Pomona College. And after college, uh, where did you attend graduate school? Uh, immediately after college, I went to law school at Harvard Law School. And after graduating from Harvard Law School, did you practice law? Yes, I did. And uh, with which firm did you practice upon graduation? I practiced with the firm of Morrison and Forster. And for how long did you practice with Morrison and Forster? Um, I was with the firm full-time for five years. I was originally hired in the Los Angeles office of Morrison and Forster, um, spent two years there in the litigation department, and then when the firm opened a Sacramento office, um, I was one of the three lawyers that went to open the firm there, and I was there for about three years in Sacramento. Um, and then uh, after I left full-time employment with the firm, I was um, also with the firm on a contract basis for a couple of years as well. And what sort of cases did you work on while you were in the Sacramento office? In the, in the Sacramento office, uh, we were doing um, some regulatory work, uh, represented a number of clients, including San Francisco Airport, um, other major corporate clients that had business before this, the state government. And did there come a time when you went back to graduate school again? Uh, yes. And uh, what further degree did you pursue? I pursued a Ph.D. in political science. And at what university? At the University of California at Berkeley. And when did you receive your Ph.D.? 2002. Uh, what is your current position? I'm an associate professor of government at Claremont McKenna College. Is that a tenured position? Yes, it is. All right, and before receiving tenure, what was your position? Uh, for six years, I was an assistant professor in the government department at that college. And have you had any teaching positions before you arrived at Claremont? For one year, I was a visiting assistant professor. Um, this is immediately before I went to Claremont at uh, the University of San Francisco. And what activities do you perform in connection with your position in the Department of Government at Claremont? So like most faculty members, I have a range of uh, activities. Uh, I have an active research um, uh, work that I do. I'm also, I have a full-time teaching load. Uh, I do various, uh, I serve on various committees at the college, and I'm also the associate director of a research institute at the college. Well, what is the name of that research institute? Uh, the Rose Institute of State and Local Government. And what do you do in connection with your work at the Rose Institute? Uh, the Rose Institute studies um, state and local politics, mainly in California, but also in other states, and I supervise uh, a lot of the research, um, particularly in the areas of redistricting, um, fiscal analysis of state and local uh, governments as well. What courses do you regularly teach at Claremont? Uh, on a regular basis, I teach Introduction to American Politics. Um, I also, I think every year, teach a class in California politics. I, uh, every year that I've been there, I've also taught a senior seminar uh, for uh, seniors in the government writing honors theses. And um, almost every year I teach an undergraduate class in constitutional law, which would be either national powers or civil rights and civil liberties. Now, in your course on California politics, what subjects do you cover? Uh, we cover uh, a range of topics relating to state government, um, starting with the founding of the state um, back in 1850, the original constitution, up through the progressive era and the introduction of uh, initiative referendum and recall in the state um, 100 years ago. 
then I fairly quickly move up to the 1960s, the Pat Brown era as governor, and talk about the professionalization of the state legislature. Um, we're moving at that point into the uh, institutions of state government, which are distinctive in California, with a term-limited legislature, a powerful initiative process, um, the state judiciary, and um, the executive branch with its separately elected officers. In addition, I cover uh, a lot of material about the changing demographics of California um, and how that's affected the, uh, the political um, uh, makeup of the state, the incorporation of racial and ethnic minorities into the political process, um, as well as the partisan shift of the state from being essentially a 50-50 a Republican and Democratic state to a majority Democratic um, state. Um, and then finally, I have the students uh, look at um, particular policy issues, either the state budget or other policy issues, and they do in-depth research projects on, um, on those uh, issues. In the California politics course you teach, to what extent, if any, do you address Proposition 8? Uh, in my section where I'm looking at state institutions, direct democracy, and courts, I have for the last several years done a unit on Proposition 8, the relationship between Proposition 8, Proposition 22, in re marriage cases, and the conflict between the people and the courts over the definition of marriage in California. So it's at least two, three um, courses in the, in, the, in the class, which is a fairly large chunk of the, of the uh, 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 syllabus. And in your class on California politics, to what extent, if any, do you address California's domestic partnership laws? Uh, in connection with that discussion I just described, I um, offer the domestic partnership laws as the legislature's contribution to uh, this controversy over legal recognition of same-sex um, couples. And so we, we definitely talk about the original um, uh, domestic partnership law in 1999 and how it was augmented over time. And in your class on California politics, do you address the role of gays and lesbians in the California political landscape? Uh, yes, we do in a couple, couple of different ways. One is in the, the context of this controversy over um, marriage in, in California. And also, uh, more broadly, when we're discussing the um, uh, the coalitions that support the two political parties in the state, um, with gays and lesbians being an important coalition partner for uh, the Democratic Party in the state. Do you address the political power of other minority groups in your class on California politics? Uh, yes, as I mentioned, we discuss uh, the incorporation of various minority groups into the political process, the, the transition, especially for immigrants, um, to becoming citizens, and then the additional steps of getting registered and voting and participating in the political process. So there's a lit literature on that that I have the students read, and we discuss that in class. All right. Now, uh, on your Amer in your American politics course, to what extent, if any, do you discuss the political power of minorities in the United States? Uh, in, for as long as I've been teaching this class, a central theme of it has been um, the uh, – the issue of racism in uh, the United States going back to prior to the, um, the founding of the uh, Constitution, the institution of slavery, the debates over slavery in the original Constitution, the period leading up to the Civil War, the Dred Scott decision, the Civil War um, that, that followed um, Abraham Lincoln's speeches in this area, um, the post-Civil Rights, I mean, the, the post-war uh, Reconstruction Amendments, and then through the, the period of um, segregation up through the civil rights movement all the way up to uh, President Obama. So it provides sort of a trajectory showing how um, uh, a particular group in our society faced discrimination and was able to achieve civil rights over a period of time. And to what extent, if any, do you address prejudice against African Americans in your course on American politics? Uh, that's, cent that's a central theme of what I've just described. Um, oftentimes I've uh, assigned a, a book or portions of a book called Simple Justice by Richard Kluger, and that certainly addresses the issues of prejudice against um, African Americans. The book is a um, discussion of the Brown versus Board of Education case, but it goes back to the origins of slavery in the United States, and it traces um, the history of discrimination against African Americans 
uh, in the United States up, up to and even after the Brown versus Board decision. And to what extent, if any, do you teach uh, in your course on American politics about the political power of gays and lesbians today? Uh, in particular, when we're talking about po political coalitions in the state and the, the two-party system and how the parties uh, form coalitions, um, we, we discuss uh, gays and lesbians as being, again, an important part of the, an increasingly important part of the democratic coalition uh, in the United States. Okay, now, you also mentioned that you perform scholarly research and writing. Uh, what is the main focus of your scholarly research? Uh, so this goes back to my time as a graduate student at Berkeley, and uh, the central focus of my research from then and until the present has been um, uh, direct democracy and, and the initiative process, in particular in California and in other states. And in that original work as a graduate student, I applied what I consider to be a Madisonian uh, critique of direct democracy and the disadvantages, in my view, that it had compared to um, representative government. And I wrote a couple of articles um, at that time which were on that theme, and it was also informed, uh, it informed my dissertation that I wrote at, at Berkeley. Um, that was in 2002 that I filed my dissertation, and the, the articles were in approximately that period, 2001 or so. Um, but I've continued to be interested in this problem of direct democracy in a constitutional system, and I wasn't fully satisfied that I'd really um, uh, gotten as, as much uh, to the, the nub of the problem as I would like to. So after I finished my uh, dissertation and PhD, I decided to have that be my continuing uh, research focus as a, as a scholar. And so in, in the, the years since, I have done, I've greatly expanded my research in this area. I now have um, a database which I've um, collected that has information on all um, voter approved initiatives in all 24 states that have the initiative process, um, not just California but the other, the other states from the beginning origins of the initiative process in the early 1900s until the present. And based on that research and um, a lot of historical research going back to the progressive era, I started to um, sort of uh, modify my views a little bit uh, from where they had been as a graduate student. Um, in particular, I had a, have a somewhat more favorable view of direct democracy in my work at this point. Um, and I now see it as a way in which the people can exercise popular sovereignty in our constitutional system. The other thing that I've come to conclude is that uh, direct democracy, which um, provides an emphasis on popular sovereignty has often come into conflict with uh, the courts or the judicial power, going all the way back to the progressive era. Perhaps you should tender the witness before he begins. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, Your Honor. Well, we'll just a, a, a few more questions on his background before we get into the substance. What is the name of your current uh, book on uh, this subject? Okay, uh, yeah, my book is called Direct Democracy in the Courts, which was published by Cambridge University Press in uh, August of 2009. And, and does that book address Proposition 8? Yes, it does. Okay. And um, you've also written a book, uh, The New Political Geography of California, is that right? Yes, I have. And briefly, what's the general thesis of that book? Uh, the, the book is a collection of, of uh, chapters. Um, it's one of these things is an edited volume, and I was one of the three editors of the volume, and we had various different contributors who were looking at um, political change in California from a geographic perspective, um, geographic as well as demographic perspective. Um, the, the main thesis of the book is that California shifted from a predominant north-south partisan divide with the north being more liberal and the south more conservative to an increasing east-west partisan divide with the eastern part or inland part more conservative and the coastal region more uh, democratic and overall the state has become increasingly democratic over the last generation and so that the book in various different ways explains that change both at the statewide and local level and, and when was that book published um, I believe that was in 2008 by uh, the book was published by um, Berkeley Public Policy Press which is a imprint of the Institute of Governmental Studies at UC Berkeley Okay, and to what extent, if any, have your journal articles focused on political issues relating to the political power of, of gays and lesbians? 
Well, uh, a recent journal article I wrote for a, a French journal on American politics uh, focused on the Proposition 8 campaign and um, my analysis of some of the reasons why Proposition 8 was unable to pass even in a state that elected Barack Obama in 2008. All right. And uh, have you given any presentations at conferences that relate to the political power of gays and lesbians? I, Proposition 8 passed, did not pass. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, why are the re reasons Proposition 8 passed? I was misstating. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> I think maybe we understood what he, yeah. what he Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, and um, so have you given any presentations at major conferences on issues relating to the political power of gays and lesbians? Yes, I have. And please describe them briefly. Okay, um, this was, I've, I've presented twice at the um, annual meeting of the American Political Science Association, which is the largest meeting of political scientists in the United States. Um, the first time was in 2005. I was on a panel. This was following the, the Goodridge decision in Massachusetts, and there were a number of panelists that were analyzing the, the probable uh, impact of that of that decision, um, and I presented a paper on the Goodrich decision and its probable impact um, uh, at that conference. The second time was last year in Toronto, another meeting of the um, APSA, and I presented. Well, I was actually on a roundtable discussion with with a number of scholars who uh, focused on the question of uh, the relationship between courts and direct democracy in the controversy over um, same-sex marriage in the United States. Are you on the editorial board <clears throat> of any uh, journals? Uh, yes, I'm on the editorial board of the California Journal of Politics and Policy, which is again based at UC Berkeley. Your Honor, we would tender Professor Miller as an expert in the field of American politics and California politics. Or near, Mr. Boyce. Yes, yes, Your Honor. Um, although um, I think I would not dispute that the uh, witness is an expert in some aspects of that very broad field. Uh, my concern is that um, uh, from looking at the expert report that he may be asked to opine on things like the political power of gays and lesbians with respect to which I think no foundation has been laid for his expertise. So um, uh, one of the things that I wonder is whether I could ask through the court um, for counsel to proffer what expert opinions, the basic expert opinions, he expects to elicit. Because if it is within the area that he has described that supports his expertise, I would have no objection. If it is outside, I would like to voir dire. Very well, Mr. Thompson. Yes, Your Honor, we, we think the political power of gays and lesbians is a subcomponent of American politics and California politics, so certainly Professor Miller is prepared to speak to that since he teaches classes and has written books on it. But. Well, then do you wish to worry dear the witness with respect to that subject? I do. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Professor Miller. Good afternoon, Mr. Uh, my name is David Boyce. It's still morning. Still morning. That's right. it's, it's, it's been a long morning. <laughs> Good morning, Professor Miller. Good morning. Uh, my name is, we haven't met, my name is David Boys, and I represent the plaintiffs. Um, have you written any peer-reviewed articles dealing with the power of gays and lesbians? Uh, I guess it would depend on uh, your definition. I believe that the... My definition of what? Of what the... Uh, if the, the power of gays and lesbians. I, I would say yes. I would say that the article that I described um, of the French Journal um, dealing with Proposition 8 dealt certainly with the power of gays and lesbians. Um, uh, other than the French article that you have referred to, have you written any peer-reviewed articles relating to the power of gays and lesbians? I, I can't say that I have any other peer-reviewed articles, no. Okay. Now let's focus on that French article. Uh, in that French article, uh, what did you say about the power of gays and lesbians? Well, one thing I said is that Proposition 8 lost 
Yes? I mean, but, I mean, <laughs> I keep coming back. Proposition 8-1, right? So the gays and lesbians lost the election. Um, and so to me that's, as I described in the article, that's certainly an outcome that goes to the, the comparative political power of gays and lesbians. That would be something that suggests they um, did not have political power, correct? Well, the, the outcome... Let me put it. Let me put it differently. That is not something that suggests that they do have political power. Is that fair? No, I don't think that's fair. Oh. So, your argument in the journal was that gays and lesbians had political power because Proposition Eight lost. Is that what you're saying? No, I I don't think that was that was not my conclusion okay. in the article. The article spoke about the campaigns on both sides, including a very strong campaign by um, the No on Eight uh, side. In this French article, um, did you put, put forth any um, description or discussion of the political power of gays and lesbians other than whatever political power you may infer from the fact that they campaigned against Proposition 8 and lost? I, I believe I talked to some extent about the, the coalition um, on uh, that supported the gay rights side. Um, I talked about the role of uh, President Obama in saying that he opposed Proposition 8. And so s certainly I think that was, these were factors that went to um, political power and powerlessness. Uh, other than this article that you've just described, have you undertaken any independent scientific research in an attempt to analyze the political power of gays and lesbians? Um, I've done a lot of work looking at ballot measures that affect um, gays and lesbians. So not just Proposition 8, but also Proposition 22, Amendment 2 in Colorado, Proposition 6 in California. And all of these are centrally, I mean, I, I think this is a central issue in this case, is whether gays and lesbians are able to exercise power in the, de the direct democratic um, context. So yes, my work has been uh, uh, importantly focused on that topic. And is that work in which you describe the political power of gays and lesbians recorded in any writings um, uh, other than this French article, any peer-reviewed articles well, other than this French article? Well, yes, it's in, it's in my um, book, which was peer-reviewed by Cambridge University Press. There are peer reviewers of that book, certainly the manuscript of that book. And there's a lot in that book about the political power of gays and lesbians. Um, do you um, hold yourself out as an expert on the extent of discrimination against gays and lesbians? Um, yes, I think that outcomes go to the, the issue of, disc of uh, discrimination. If gays and lesbians are able to achieve um, positive <laughs> outcomes in the political process, then that would um, affect, or it would be evidence that one can draw inferences about um, their ability to overcome discrimination. My question is, is not so much right now what you conclude, but you hold yourself out to be an expert in the history and existence or non-existence of discrimination against gays and lesbians. Is that correct? I would, I would say less so about the history, but more so about the, the present um, level of discrimination, the ability of the gay and lesbian a movement to overcome discrimination to achieve their political goals. And I think I'm an, I can say that I believe that I'm an expert on that question, yes. On the expert, on the question of whether gays and lesbians experience discrimination today, are you an expert on that, in your view? In my view, yes, I think so. Okay. Are you uh, an expert as to whether gays and lesbians have experienced discrimination over the last 50 years? Um, I would say that that hasn't been a focus of my research. I'm but simply asking you, sir, whether you hold yourself out as an expert in that or not. Well, I would say in the course of this um, work as an expert in this case, I've, I've learned more about it for sure, and I, I think that I could probably write a, an article on this topic um, at this point. But I haven't written on it before. <coughs> I, I think that my expertise is more in the, in the contemporary period as opposed to what you s described as 50 years ago. Um, what would you say were the most important academic writings 
on the subject of discrimination against gays and lesbians today? Um, so my area of, of uh, work where I'm most familiar with literature goes to um, uh, legal writings. And so I would say the work by Dan Piniello, um, by Professor Eskrich, by again. Professor Eskrich, um, uh, Susan Mezzi. Um, these would be some people that I would say would be important scholars in this area. Um, and you would recognize those three people as important scholars in this area whose work that you would rely on. Is that correct? I think they'd be important scholars in this area. Um, uh, now, with respect to um, the, the question of the political power of gays and lesbians, is your expertise on that limited to the present time? I wouldn't say that it's, I'm not holding myself out as um, an expert on the, um, the full history of the gay and lesbian uh, uh, rights movement. I have read, um, about it, and so I, I think I have a view of the trajectory of the movement my, uh, based on what I've read. Um, but I would say that it's, it's fair to say that my, um, the deeper knowledge is on the more contemporary period, say from the 1970s forward. Um, for example, at, the, at your deposition, um, you were not aware of what the Mattachine Society was, were you? Uh, I could not recall what that was at that time. Have you uh, researched that since? I uh, did take a look and did some further investigation and learned about the Mattachine Society, yes, as being founded by Harry Hay and, um, around 1950 and being an important early uh, gay rights uh, organization. And uh, did it play a particular role in the 1970s, the area that you said that you were an expert in? Well, yeah, the, the, it, there are different iterations of this society. Bro it um, was founded at first in Los Angeles and then had other um, organizations. And All I was asking is whether it played a particular important role in the 1970s, which was a period that you said you were an expertise in. Well, I... Um, Answer that question, yes or no. I, I believe that it did, yes. But nevertheless, that is something that you were not familiar with at the time you did your expert report, correct? Uh, that's something I've learned about and read about more extensively since then. And at your deposition, you were not aware whether the general social survey, when they began asking respondents whether they were gay or lesbian, correct? That's correct. And would you explain for the record what the general social survey is? This is a, an important major um, survey that political scientists do of um, to get uh, uh, information about various questions, public opinion, and so forth. And at the time of your deposition, you didn't know who Alan Spear was, did you? That's correct. And you didn't know who Elaine Noble was, correct? That's correct. Now, since your deposition, have you discovered who those people were? No, I haven't done further investigation on those. Um, you, don't, you don't know that Alan Spear was the first openly gay man elected to state office? Uh, I, I did not know that, no. You didn't know that Elaine Noble was the first openly gay woman elected to state office? I did not know that, no. They were so elected in 1976 and 1975, respectively? Um, again, I, I didn't know their names, no. I knew that openly gay people were first elected to office in the mid-1970s. Um, Your Honor, um, we uh, would object to his qualification as an expert in the areas of uh, discrimination against gays and lesbians or in uh, gay and lesbian political power outside of the particular area of initiatives. Um, uh, in the area of initiatives, we think he's been qualified as, as an expert, uh, but outside of that area, uh, he is not uh, published any peer review articles, he's not done any research, he's not recognized as an expert in the field, he doesn't even know many of the key facts and people involved. It seems to me the witness's qualifications <coughs> to offer 
opinion testimony with respect to American politics and California politics in particular is not disputed. Implicit in that area of expertise is knowledge of the influence and power of particular groups in American and California politics. And I think it's therefore appropriate that he can include in his uh, area of expertise uh, testimony having to do with the uh, role of gays and lesbians in American and California politics. Uh, I don't understand that the defendants are offering the witnesses an expert in the history of discrimination against gays and lesbians. Correct, Your Honor, we're not. So to the degree that uh, the uh, witnesses' testimony spills beyond what uh, he's being offered for in uh, testifying concerning the history of American and California politics and the role of various groups within it. I think I'll admit the testimony and weigh uh, that testimony in accordance with uh, what is brought out in direct and cross-examination. So you may proceed, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, and at this point, I'd like to publish demonstrative number one on the screen. And uh, Professor Miller, what are the key determinants of political power? Uh, political power is uh, multifaceted. It has um, a lot of different factors that can cont contribute to power. Um, and I would just list a few of them. Um, one would be certainly money, uh, access to lawmakers, the size and cohesion of a group, um, the ability to attract allies and form coalitions, and the ability to persuade. All right, and I'd like to publish demonstrative two. Uh, and could you please explain what is the relative Im importance of money in the American political system? Um, I think any political scientist would tell you that money is a, a critical asset for um, achieving um, uh, political power. Uh, if you just look at the Citizen United case in recent days, the um, strong uh, reaction by both sides about the changing rules about how money can be used in politics demonstrates clearly that money is an important factor in the political process. Um, specifically with res respect to um, elections, either candidate elections or ballot measure elections, money allows <clears throat> a group to um, be heard to be able to get out their message to the electorate and to the voters who make the ultimate decisions. And, and what does, if anything, does the Proposition 8 campaign demonstrate about the ability of gays and lesbians to raise money in support of their political goals? Um, it, it was striking to me the amount of money that was raised on both sides of uh, the election of uh, Proposition 8. Um, Forty-three million dollars were raised and spent by the opponents of Proposition 8, which exceeded uh, very large um, contributions and expenditures by the No on 8 campaign. Uh, by, I'm sorry, by the, by the Yes on 8 campaign. I'm going to get this right yet. <laughs> now, um, w with respect to your database that you've collected at the Rose Institute of all the initiatives that have uh, been held in the United States, how many groups have raised more than $43 million as part of a, balloted, a ballot initiative campaign? Well, it's, it's exceptionally rare. There's no other social issue that's ever involved this kind of money. Um, there have been a few measures um, involving uh, regulatory issues, um, Indian gaming, things like that, that have been in this neighborhood or even, even larger. But for a social issue where there's, there's not sort of a corporate interest on one side or, or the other that's um, basically funding the campaign, um, this is exceptional. And I'd like to publish Demonstrative 3. And what is the significance of access to lawmakers? Uh, again, political scientists would all agree that having access to lawmakers is an important resource for a group, for any group, um, particularly a mi minority group. That's in part because powerful lawmakers um, 
they have uh, time for them as a scarce resource. There's a lot of people who want time with them, and so they have to make decisions about how to spend their time, who to give time to. Um, so just getting access in a, where there's a scarce resource um, demonstrates that the group has some form of political power. Um, additionally, access is important because it raises the visibility of the group's um, issue that they're promoting. If they can get access to the legislature, then they're able to um, uh, increase the visibility of their issue. Um, I would say third, access is important because it gives the group a distinctive ability to persuade the lawmaker. If the, uh, if the group is shut out, doesn't have an ability to get a, a meeting with the lawmaker, um, then it's more difficult to make that group's case. And so access facilitates persuasion. It's the fourth thing I would say is maybe not as well um, recognized, but it's partly based on my time um, uh, studying this and actually working in a couple of legislatures, is that lawmakers have incredible political networks. And, and if you're an interest group that wants to promote your agenda, getting access to the lawmakers will oftentimes facilitate your ability to get connected with other people in that lawmaker's political network and to form a coalition. How would that work? Well, the lawmaker would, um, if, if the lawmaker was sympathetic to the goals objective, uh, or the, the group's objectives, then the lawmaker might say, well, um, you know, you should probably talk, so for example, if the if, if gays and lesbians had a particular legislative agenda and they needed to build a, a larger coalition, the lawmaker was sympathetic. The lawmaker might also have alliances with um, unions or other groups, and so the lawmaker could help set up meetings and make introductions and those, those sorts of things. I'd like to publish demonstrative number four. And how, if at all, does the size and cohesion of a group affect its political power? Uh, starting with size, size is obviously um, an advantage to a group. If, if a group has larger numbers, then that can be translated into a larger number of votes and in a democratic majoritarian process, the closer you can get to a majority is obviously to your advantage. Um, and that's, there's just a little bit of a caveat about that because if your group is not cohesive, it can be large, but it can be internally divided as to what its objectives are. So cohesion, in addition to size, are important um, assets in, in attaining political power. And, and for minority groups, to what extent, if any, uh, because they have, by definition, a small size, do they have to rely on coalition partners? Uh, well, I would say in the American political system, which is pluralistic and you have lots of interest groups, um, Again, this is sort of a Madisonian view of um, American politics with uh, multiplicity of groups or factions in the society. Basically, everybody has to form coalitions and, and um, make alliances in order to achieve their political goals. If you're a minority group, particularly a smaller minority group, then coalition building and forming alliances becomes even more important to your attaining your goals objectives. I'd like to publish Demonstrative 5 and ask you, which groups, if any, are allied politically with gays and lesbians today? Okay, based on my uh, analysis of recent um, political history and the way things work, I would say that the Democratic Party over the last decade certainly has become a strong ally of the LGBT rights movement um, in California and also nationally. Um, a second important ally for gays and lesbians have been elected officials at all levels of government, from Congress and the White House all the way down to local governments, um, state legislatures and as well. Um, a third group has been organized labor. And as I examined this, I was struck by the extent to which organized labor has coalesced as a strong um, ally of the LGBT rights movement, particularly around this area of um, recognition of same-sex relationships. Um, a fourth group um, is corporations, and this is increasingly true. The evidence suggests that major corporations are becoming increasingly allied with um, the LGBT rights movement. Uh, I guess this is the fifth uh, uh, important ally of uh, gays and lesbians have been newspapers. Um, I've done a, a systematic investigation of California newspapers, but also national newspapers like the New York Times, 
have been important allies of um, uh, gays and lesbians in the LGBT rights movement. Um, another asset can be celebrities because they can provide, um, they can garner media attention for the group's interests and um, provide positive um, associations for the group. Uh, next would be churches and faith-based religious organizations. Um, these groups are often uh, organized and they can um, get volunteers to uh, help on political campaigns. Uh, and so if you have alliances with um, churches and faith-based organizations, that can be an important asset for you um, in attaining political power. And um, finally, another group would be political, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, professional associations of um, physicians, doctors, others who um, uh, can be important allies in the political process as well. Well, let's look at each of those allies one at a time, and I'd like to publish Demonstrative 6 uh, and ask you, how powerful is the Democratic Party in California today? Again, this was um, part of my work on that book, The New Political Geography of California. I looked uh, deeply at this issue and um, traced how the, politi the political um, balance in the state has shifted from basically a 50-50 situation in 1980 uh, where Republicans and Democrats were comparable politically um, in, in terms of their power in the state. That's really changed in the last generation so that the Democratic Party in California is the dominant um, political party in the state. There's a few statistics that would um, provide evidence for that. One is voter registration. The most recent statistics I found were from the Secretary of State's office. In February of 2009, uh, Democrats were 45 percent of registered voters, 45.5 percent of registered voters in California, where Republicans had dropped to 31.1 percent of uh, the electorate. The balance is either small parties or declined to state. But that's a major gap between Democrats and Republicans in, in voter registration. Uh, a second measure would be elected officials in the state. If you look at the state assembly, the current, um, actually this has uh, uh, changed a bit. There have been a couple of uh, elections so that the uh, recent, we're at 49 um, to 29 Democrats to uh, Republicans with one independent and one um, open seat. So that's still a very, it's a large gap between Democrats and Republicans in the state assembly. In the state Senate, there are 25 uh, Democrats and 15 Republicans, a gap of uh, 10 legislators. So the Democrats don't have a two, quite a two-thirds majority in either house of the state legislature, but it's a substantial majority. And there's, there's no filibuster rule or anything like that in the state legislature. So if the Democrats want to pass something through the legislature, with the exception of the state budget, which requires a two-thirds vote, they're basically able to do what they want legislatively. Um, at the uh, state constitutional officer level, there are eight separately elected state constitutional offices in California. Five of those eight are currently held by uh, Democrats. Um, from the, there's, the lieutenant governorship is vacant now that John Garamendi has gone to Congress, but um, the attorney general, secretary of state, treasurer, controller, uh, the superintendent of public instruction, I think I'm getting those all, um, those are all held by, by Democrats. Um, in the United States Congress, the congressional delegation from California, which was um, again a 50-50, I think it was 22 to 21 in 1980, Democrat to Republican. There's been a major shift um, toward the Democratic Party. Today, 34 of our 53 House members from California are Democrat, as well as for many years now, both um, senators, U.S. Senators, uh, Barbara Boxer and Dianne Feinstein are um, Democrats. <laughs> and finally, I'd note that um, in the last presidential election, uh, President Obama won 60.95% of the statewide popular vote. That's the largest popular vote um, uh, percentage in any election by any candidate since 1936 when FDR won in a landslide election. So this is showing that there's a, a, a really, a, this is a blue state is the way I would put it.
Uh, now, uh, turning to Demonstrative 7, to what extent, if any, does the Democratic Party in California support the political goals of gays and lesbians? Uh, so the Democratic Party in its public statements, the California Democratic Party in its public statements, has come out strongly in favor of LGBT rights. In its 2008 um, party platform, uh, the California Democratic Party said, quote, we take pride in and celebrate our diversity and work to foster the common values and commitments that unite all people, regardless of their age, cultural heritage, national origin, disability, socioeconomic status, gender, race, sexual orientation, or views on religion. The platform went on to state that it pledges to fight for all people to live with dignity and equality. California Democrats will support non-discrimination and equality for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people in all aspects of their lives. We support the LGBT community in its quest for the right to legal marriage. Now, beyond the platform, what other recent statements, if any, has the Democratic Party made in support of the political goals of gays and lesbians? Um, notably, after Proposition 8 was passed in November of 2008, uh, the Democratic California Democratic Party adopted a resolution. This was in April, um, April 26, 2009. It was titled, Support Same-Sex Couples in Their Right to Marry by Repealing Proposition 8. And the resolution read as follows, Therefore be it resolved that the California Democratic Party stands in solidarity with same-sex couples and their fight to retain the right to marry by joining with them and urging the voters of the state of California to repeal Proposition 8 within the next two years should it be upheld by the um, Supreme Court. And by that, they meant the California Supreme Court. All right, now turning to Demonstrative 8, to what extent have elected officials in California been political allies of gays and lesbians? Okay, I can run through the, the eight uh, statewide elected uh, officials, um, starting with Governor Schwarzenegger. And I would, I would characterize Governor Schwarzenegger as being an ally of the LGBT community. Now that's, um, when we talk about allies, it's not necessarily on every issue at every time, but um, on many issues, and increasingly so, the governor has supported the LGBT rights movement. Um, he has signed LGBT rights legislation, including most recently uh, legislation which um, recognized same-sex marriages from other states. Um, other evidence of his support for the LGBT rights uh, uh, movement is that he opposed the federal marriage amendment. He also opposed Proposition 8. And in this litigation, the governor uh, declined to uh, defend Proposition 8 against the plaintiff's constitutional uh, uh, challenge. Now, who, who plays a role in controlling access to the governor of California? Uh, the most important gatekeeper would be the governor's chief of staff. That's true in most gubernatorial administrations, and it's true here as well. And who, who is the uh, governor's chief of staff? Uh, the governor's chief of staff is Susan Kennedy. And what is your opinion about whether she is an ally of the gay and lesbian uh, political rights? Um, Ms. Kennedy is uh, herself an openly uh, lesbian person, and she is, a, uh, uh, I, I would guess, a, a strong advocate of uh, LGBT uh, rights. And she's made that clear in public pronouncements as well. All right. Now, uh, with respect to the most recent uh, lieutenant governor, uh, to what extent, if any, was he an ally of uh, gays and lesbians? Uh, John Garamendi, a longtime elected official in California, the former lieutenant governor, now a member of Congress, was uh, clearly an advocate of LGBT rights. He endorsed legislative efforts to make California uh, marriage laws gender neutral. Uh, and he also opposed Proposition 8. All right, and turning to demonstrative number nine, what is your opinion about uh, the level of support that Attorney General Jerry Brown has showed toward the political goals of gays and lesbians? Uh, so the Attorney General, the former governor, um, potential future governor of California, um, is, in my view, an, a strong ally of the LGBT rights movement. Um, uh, one of the leading LGBT rights organizations in California, um, Equality California, 
has recognized the governor or uh, the attorney general's <laughs> um, support for uh, its movement. The director of Equality California, Greg uh, Kors, stated, Equality California is extremely appreciative of the Attorney General's continued leadership in opposition to Proposition 8 and in support of ending discrimination against lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender LGBT Californians. The time has come for all elected leaders to follow Jerry Brown's example and stand up for equality for all Americans, regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity. Equality California will continue our position of not endorsing or supporting any candidate for any level of public office who does not completely and unequivocally support total equality for our community. Now, what is your opinion of the extent to which, if any, Secretary of State Bowen has been an ally of the gay and lesbian political community? Um, again, I would say that the Secretary of State has been uh, an, a notable ally of the community. She um, has asserted so herself in a 2007 letter recognizing LGBT Pride Month, the Secretary of State wrote, I, quote, I am proud to stand with you in the continued fight for equal rights under the law as your Secretary of State, as I stood with you at every turn during my 14-year tenure in the legislature on civil rights issues. All right, and turning to Demonstrative 10, what level of support, if any, has the Treasurer shown to the political goals of gays and lesbians? Uh, so the current state treasurer, Bill Lockyer, former two-term attorney general, former state legislator, has um, become a strong ally of the LGBT rights movement. Uh, in 2003, he endorsed the landmark domestic partnership law, which was enacted by the legislature. He opposed Proposition 8. He made monetary contributions to the No on 8 campaign. Um, and when he was running for treasurer, uh, Equality California's executive director, Greg Kors, wrote, quote, Bill scored a perfect 100% on our candidate questionnaire, and we are confident that he will be a hardworking advocate for civil rights and equality for all in the treasurer's office. All right, and with respect to the controller, what level of support, if any, has he shown to the political goals of gays and lesbians? Uh, John Chong, the state controller, is also considered a strong proponent of LGBT rights. Uh, the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force stated that Chong has been a steadfast ally of LGBT people throughout his career in public life. An opponent of Proposition 8, he has spoken out for marriage equality for committed same-sex couples during Pride season and throughout the year. Turning to Demonstrative 11, uh, what is your opinion as all, all, that, all that is being done is using these demonstratives as leading questions. And what's happening is putting up a demonstrative, the witness is essentially reading it in the record. Your Honor, the, these are uh, not yes or no uh, questions. This is consistent with what Professor Badgett did, uh, and this is uh, the, the the witness. I'm, I'm happy to refer to the documents in the binder, uh, Your Honor. I thought this would be a more efficient way to quickly move, uh, and we're we're making very good progress. I'm happy to say. Well, uh, I wouldn't want to interfere with your progress. You may proceed. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Um, so just to quickly round out the picture, uh, Professor, uh, with respect to the uh, Superintendent of Public uh, Instruction, to what extent, uh, has, if any, has he been uh, an ally of the gay and lesbian political rights movement? Well, Jack O'Connell, the Superintendent, has been a, a strong ally. Evidence for that was he was on um, uh, television commercials uh, advocating the defeat of Proposition 8. All right, now turning to Demonstrative 12, how much support, if any, is there in the California legislature for the goals of gays and lesbians? Uh, I, I think it's fair to say that it's striking the, the degree of support for uh, the LGBT rights movement by the California legislature over the past decade, um, particularly in the legislature's uh, majority Democratic caucus. And, and um, how, which was the first state in the union to have uh, uh, an official caucus for openly LGBT state legislators? Uh, California was the first state to, to do that. It was, there have been eight members of the LGBT caucus over time, and there are currently uh, four members of that caucus. All right, and turning to demonstrative 13, how supportive are leading 
local officials in California of the political goals of gays and lesbians? Uh, so there are many local officials who have publicly supported the LGBT rights community, and, or the LGBT community and rights for that community. Um, most notably is the mayor of this city, San Francisco Mayor Gavin Newsom, who is a nationally recognized advocate of um, same-sex marriage and the rights of uh, gays and lesbians. Um, the second largest city in America, Los Angeles, has a mayor, Antonio Villaraigosa, who's been a strong advocate of um, LGBT rights. He publicly opposed Proposition um, 8 and made a monetary contribution of $25,000 to the No on 8 campaign. And another example we've seen in this case was the mayor of, uh, the Republican mayor of San Diego, Jerry Sanders, who um, clearly publicly is an ally of the LGBT community. All right, and turning to demonstrative 14, to what extent, if any, have local governments supported the political goals of gays and lesbians? Uh, so evidence of this would be um, advocating uh, legislation um, that would promote domestic partner benefits or same-sex marriage or both. And a number of governments, including the city and county of San Francisco, cities of Berkeley, Cloverdale, Davis, if you go through the state, it would include um, in the south, San Diego, um, in the Los Angeles area, you've got West Hollywood, Long Beach. And so throughout the state, many um, city governments and um, county governments have supported LGBT rights publicly. All right, very well. And turning to Demonstrative 15, uh, to what extent, if any, do gays and lesbians have allies among California's federal representatives? Uh, again, uh, as I mentioned, that, uh, many of the California's uh, federal elected officials are supportive of LGBT rights. These would include our two U.S. Senators, Senator uh, Barbara Boxer and Dianne Feinstein, House Speaker. Nancy Pelosi uh, this, uh, is also a, an ally of the LGBT rights movement. All right, and uh, turning to Demonstrative 16, I'd like to shift gears, and you had mentioned uh, at the beginning that organized labor was, in your opinion, an ally. Uh, please describe the relationship between uh, the gay rights movement and organized labor. Uh, again, as I said, I, I think it's striking the extent to which organized labor has um, coalesced in support of um, the LGBT rights uh, movement. This is, there's evidence for this in uh, contributions to uh, ballot, measures, or ballot measure campaigns, the No on 8 campaign, um, as well as supporting uh, legislation in uh, the state legislature. Uh, so um, if you look at the roster of every major um, labor organization in California, from the California Teachers Association, one of the most pow powerful interests in the state, the Service Employees International Union, um, public employees unions as well as um, private sector uh, unions, AFL-CIO, the Teamsters, the farm workers, basically every major labor organization that I could think of has come out publicly in support of the LGBT rights movement. All right, and turning to Demonstrative 17, uh, how, how else, if at all, has organized labor supported the rights of gays and lesbians? Uh, so just to take a couple of the examples that I just mentioned, the California Teachers Association, which has over 340,000 members and is widely considered by people who study California politics to be one of the, the most powerful interest groups in the state, um, has promoted same-sex marriage in California. They donated, the, the union, out of union dues, donated, donated $1.3 million to the No on 8 campaign. And after the election, they also filed an amicus brief seeking invalidation of Proposition 8. In addition, another large and influential union in California, the California State Council of the SEIU, the Service Employees International Union, uh, donated $500,000 to the No on 8 campaign and um, also supported same-sex marriage legislation in the legislature and signed an amicus brief um, seeking the invalidation of Proposition 8. All right. So those, now, would be, those would be two examples of major unions in California. All right. Now, turning to Demonstrative 18, you mentioned <laughs> newspapers. Uh, please describe the level of support, if any, for the political goals of gays and lesbians among newspapers. In connection with my expert report, I looked at the editorial endorsements of the 23 largest newspapers in California by circulation. And of those 23, 21 of the 23 
endorsed a no on eight um, position. Two of the, the remaining two out of the 23 did not take a position one, one way or the other. So there was no major newspaper in California that took the yes on eight position. Um, and just uh, to, to mention some of the, the most major ones, the Los Angeles Times, the San Francisco Chronicle, San Jose Mercury News. These, these are major urban newspapers in the uh, sort of more liberal areas of the state. But if you also look at a place like the Orange County Register, not necessarily known as a liberal newspaper, also came out in um, opposition to Proposition 8. All right, and uh, turning to corporations, how would you describe the relationship between major corporations and the political goals of gays and lesbians? Uh, I would say that this is another striking development over the past um, decade or more, which is to say that major corporations have internally in their own employment practices and, and also in their um, engagement in public um, policy issues have become increasingly allied with uh, the LGBT rights movement. Um, some evidence would, of that would be um, uh, reports put out annually by the Human Rights Campaign, the, the nation's largest LGBT rights organization. They've done extensive uh, work um, analyzing the policies and practices of the nation's largest corporations. I think the, the 2010 um, uh, survey looked at 590 of these large corporations and they rated them on a number of measures as to whether they were uh, uh, supportive or not of the LGBT community and LGBT rights. Um, the findings of that uh, report called the Corporate Equality Index um, in 2010 were that 305 of these major corporations um, achieved um, a 100 percent rating on this um, organization's uh, 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 survey. 99 percent of these employers provide employment protections on the basis of sexual orientation. And um, another category that was part of the, the criteria um, was that um, the extent to which corporations were um, advocating on behalf of LGBT uh, rights in, the, in communities in the political process. And the, the report found that major employers, quote, step forward in unprecedented ways, including steadfast support for marriage equality in California. All right, and, and let's uh, talk about that specifically, uh, about uh, what corporations did in response to Proposition 8 and turning to Demonstrative 20. How did Google uh, respond to Proposition 8? Okay, Google, which is, as everyone knows, the, the world's largest Internet company and one of the most important businesses in the state of California, typically doesn't take positions on um, controversial political questions. But uh, prior to the vote on Proposition 8, um, Sergey Brin, the co-founder of Google, uh, uh, issued a message on the Google blog that urged a no vote on Proposition 8. And what about Silicon Valley's more generally? What position did they take on Proposition 8? Okay, so shortly after Google took this stand, other Silicon Valley um, major players, um, including uh, uh, Yahoo, uh, Cisco, eBay, and sort of the who's who of Silicon Valley. Uh, the leaders of those organizations formed uh, an organization um, and came out publicly in opposition to Proposition 8. In October, just about a week before the election, the end of October, they issued a full-page ad in the San Jose Mercury News which read as follows, quote, as Silicon Valley leaders, we are committed to equality and fairness. We are opposed to Proposition 8 because it would change our state constitution to take away rights from one group of people. Vote no on Proposition 8 on November 4th. Okay, and turning to uh, the next demonstrative, to what extent did these words of corporate leaders translate into action? Uh, so if, if you conceive of action to include making major political contributions, that would be one, certainly. Is, um, if you look at um, contributions to uh, gay rights organizations, um, the uh, list of major corporate contributors to Equality California is just one example among many. Would include major corporations such as AT&T, Time Warner, Warner Cable, 
um, Clear Channel, Kaiser Permanente, Southern California Edison. So this is not just tech companies. This is a wide range of major corporations that do business in California, made contributions according to the Equality California website, totaling $5,000 to uh, $250,000 or above. Okay, now, to what extent, if any, has the entertainment industry supported the political goals of gays and lesbians? So, um, I would say, I think it's fair to say that the entertainment inter industry generally, although maybe not um, 100%, has supported the LGBT rights movement. But certainly, as, as an industry, it's been, in my view, supportive. And um, some evidence of this is that corporations um, and individuals in the in industry made uh, major financial contributions to the No on 8 campaign or have otherwise supported the movement for same-sex marriage. And some of those people include, uh, or organizations include Lucasfilms, David Geffen, Steven Spielberg, Cape Capshaw, Brad Pitt, um, Ellen DeGeneres, um, Stephen King, Michael King, and um, Mr. Reiner as well. Uh, Your Honor, we've come to a logical stopping point. I'm happy to keep going if the court would like, but I notice it's getting close to the lunch hour. I think it is. All right. Why don't we take until uh, 10 minutes after the hour, and we'll resume then with further examination of uh, Mr. Miller. Thank you, Your Honor. Very well. Oh, oh Your Honor, there is I, I do apologize. There is one thing I wanted to raise. Uh, Uh, I thought it might facilitate the court's review of the pink and the yellow. We have next to the pink specified the page and line number that we contend we are designating counter to. In other words, the, the, the pink and the yellow don't tell you what we're designating against. And so we, next to each pink, we have written, here's the page and the line number that we are countering to. And we thought that would facilitate the court's review. And if there's no objection, we'd like to hand that out. I assume no objection, Mr. Boutros? No objection. What, what color is it? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Very well. I'll see you uh, 10 minutes after 1. <laughs>